Now, let's turn to looking at the business side. One way to sort of, we teach in business schools is to sort of, in, in, in to understand competitive, competitive advantage is to look at your, your position on the, the, the sort of relative to cost and differentiation. So if on the x-axis we have your cost position relative to, to other in companies in your industry, and on the y-axis we have differentiation, how much, how much value are you providing? Usually there is a trade-off. You, you know, if you have really low cost, it's really high, difficult to be high quality. So there's a trade-off. Now, any company that is not on the frontier is effectively out of competition. You need to be on the operationally effective frontier. You need to be at the, the margins of the trade-off. Now, what does AI do here? Uh, AI basically does two things. One is, is that it allows you to reduce costs, so pushes the frontier out to the right, and on the other hand, it potentially allows you to make better products, personalize, and increase differentiation, hence pushing the frontier up. So you, on one hand, AI becomes, in this picture, something that you have to do to stay competitive. Without AI, your costs are going to be out of whack with your competition. You're going to fall behind. Without AI, you're, you're not going to be able to match the personalization the product development capabilities of your competitors. We see this in, in, in industries um, as different from pharma to elsewhere, where AI is becoming a key component to, to research processes. Okay, so a so couple sort of key points about the, the effects of this. One is economies of scale. So if you think about training an algorithm, for instance, for medical diagnostics, like here, you know, to recognize brain scans and to, to sort of understand, uh, you, you know, to diagnose people's brain scans and to sort of understand what, what disease people would have. What's striking about this compared to sort of doing it with, with human doctors is, is, is that once the algorithm is trained, every application of the algorithm is free, effectively costless to run the algorithm for another image. And it's also almost costless to, to sort of transfer it somewhere else. You know, if one hospital adopts this algorithm and another hospital adopts it, you don't need to, you, you need to train the human, human doctors to sort of use this machine, but the algorithm doesn't need to be retrained. The algorithm can be transferred. Same thing in industrial robots. You only need to train one robot. They can all learn from that robot. From the same algorithm can be copied. Humans, you, we need to train individually every single one. And every single one has to deploy time to do something. Time that could have been used elsewhere. These computer algorithms, the marginal cost is, is low. The development cost is high, but the marginal cost is low, which means a significant economy is a scale. This, this is already in evidence in... in uh, in real-world data, where we see that hiring uh, AI, you know, AI applications are leading to increased concentration in industries. So there is an increasing, there are significant economies of scale. You, the average cost goes down the more you, more you apply it. There's also what we find, interestingly, is economies of scope. You know, if you think about Alexa, Amazon has invested an in, in, immense amount of money to develop Alexa as, as sort of uh, understand natural language, understand questions, you know, pick out the sound from the background noise and so on. But then this can be applied in so many ways. You can, you can have Alexa devices from the Echo things at your home. You can have even rings now, glasses, various other devices. You can have clients in computers, laptops, phones and so on. You can have third-party applications. You can link it to various other services. You can have compatible IoT devices in your home from lighting to security to so on. And again, you know, average cost, this is developed once. Alexa was developed once and keep improving. But the, the more applications you find, the lower the cost. AI allows feedback loops that potentially give you switching costs. Once pros has customized the shampoo for you, do you ever want to go elsewhere? Y you know, do you want to spend the, the next six months training somebody else's algorithm? If you, if you have now 
a product tailored for you. It's the same thing, you, you know, you may not know this, but Amazon's recommendations, Amazon's operations, they learn eventually sort of to tailor the services to you and to the you know region where you live so that the items come faster, they come, they have the right selection, they can recommend you the right things. They become increasingly adapted and create effectively switching costs that are harder for anybody else to catch. This loop, the feedback loop is effectively what potentially allows for cumulative advantage again. You know, more data allows for better prediction, better AI algorithms, leads to more customers, leads to more data. This could potentially lead to cumulative advantage and, and sort of effectively cement your advantage. There's, there's a bit of a countervailing force to this though, which is that the marginal value of the data, every, more, every bit of data that you collect gives you less new information because it's going to be partly replicating old information. But second, the cost, you know, collecting more data, the cost is going to go up potentially exponentially. And so eventually the marginal benefit is going to equal the marginal cost and, and, and the data is not valuable anymore. You, you know, they've learned enough to sort of what, what can be incorporated into that prose formula. They've, they've learned enough about your style, your hair, and so on. And, and at that point, you, once you stop learning, or the learning slows down, gives potentially possibility for others to catch up. Also, one of the key things to understand is this learning and data, the underlying data, depreciates over time. So, you, you know, what to wear in 2020, you know, there are uh, changes in styles, but, you, you know, they happen relatively slowly. There's some other settings where the data depreciates more fast. For instance, you know, understanding traffic jams, they come and go within the span of minutes in, in, so, so that the data on traffic jams can get old very quickly. So, so the, the value of the data, you, you know, in case of sort of predicting traffic, for instance, you need to have very, very recent accurate data. Okay, so what can companies do in order to catch up? What can they do to get the data? So one thing, so the two possibilities here, one is synthetic data, effectively machine-generated data. Second is federated learning, and the federated learning, I suspect, will be a big topic, and it already is, and for instance, in pharma. Companies are training algorithms. So federated learning means that you're training an algorithm in different places. You know, you can train an algorithm in different hospitals' data, different individuals' data, and combine it into uh, uh, one model without sort of losing the, 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 without them technically sharing the details of the data. The World Knowledge Forum.